When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies published back in the 30s linking smoking and lung cancer were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies. It was everywhere. Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. It's like the debates over cigarettes and lung cancer in Congress taking place in smoke-filled rooms. It makes me wonder what's served at the breakfast buffets at the Dietary Guidelines Committee meetings these days. I previously talked about a famous statistician by the name of Ronald Fisher who railed against what he called propaganda to convince the public that cigarette smoking was dangerous. Fisher made invaluable contributions to the fields of statistics, but his analysis of lung cancer smoking were flawed by an unwillingness to examine the entire body of data available. His smoke screen may have been because he was a paid consultant to, to the tobacco industry, but also because he was himself a smoker. Uh, part of his resistance to seeing the association may have been rooted in his own fondness for smoking, which makes me wonder about some of the uh, foods nutrition researchers may be fond of to this day. It always strikes me as ironic when vegetarian researchers come forward and list their diet as a potential conflict of interest, whereas not once in the 70,000 articles on meat in the medical literature have I ever seen a researcher disclose their non-vegetarian habits because it's normal, just like smoking was normal. How could something that's so normal be bad for you? And it's not like you smoke one cigarette and fall over dead. Right? Cancer takes decades to develop. Uh, since at that time most physicians smoked themselves and could not observe any immediate deleterious effects, they were reluctant to accept even the possibility of such a relation, despite the mountain of evidence. It may have taken 25 years for the Surgeon General's report to come out, and longer still for mainstream medicine to get on board, but now there are no longer ads encouraging people to inhale to your heart's content. Now there are ads from the CDC fighting back. For food ads, you don't have to go all the way back to meat for health defense, or nourishing bacon, or doctors prescribing meat, or soda for that matter. Thank heavens tricks are habit-forming. You know, things are bad when the sanest dietary advice came from cigarette ads. In modern times, you can see hot dogs certified by the American Heart Association, or sirloin tips for that matter. And of all foods, which was the first to get the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics kids eat right on their label? Was it an apple? Uh, broccoli, perhaps? No, Kraft prepared cheese product. Now, just like uh, there were those in the 30s, 40s, and 50s on the vanguard trying to save lives, today there are those turning ads about what you can do with pork butt to what the pork can do to your butt. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine's Meat is the New Tobacco campaign. As Dr. Barnard tried to get across in an editorial published in the American Medical Association's Journal of Ethics, plant-based diets can now be considered the nutritional equivalent of quitting smoking. How many more people have to die, though, before the CDC encourages people not to wait for open-heart surgery uh, to start eating healthy as well? But just like we don't have to wait until our doctor stops smoking to quit ourselves, we don't have to wait until our doctor takes a nutrition class or cleans up their own diet before choosing to eat healthier. No longer do doctors hold a professional monopoly on health information. There's been a democratization of knowledge. And so until the system changes, we have to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up with the science again because it's a matter of life and death. In 2005, Dr. Kim Malliam Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked 
Why he follows his own advice to eat a plant-based diet, I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. I previously described how ginger works as well as the leading drug in the treatment of migraines, described as one of the most common pain syndromes affecting as much as 12% of the population. You call that common? How about menstrual cramps that plague up to 90% of younger women? You can tell this was written by a guy because he emphasizes the absenteeism and all the lost productivity for our nation, but it also just really hurts. So can ginger help? A quarter teaspoon of ground ginger, a ginger powder, given three times a day during the first three days of menstruation, and pain dropped from like a 7 on a scale of 1 to 10 down to a 5, whereas in the placebo group there was no significant change. Most women in the placebo group said their symptoms stayed the same, whereas those unknowingly in the ginger group said they felt much better. A subsequent study found that even just an eighth of a teaspoon, three times a day, appeared to work just as well, dropping pain from uh, an 8 to a 6, but then the second month down to a 3. The alleviation of menstrual pain was more remarkable during the second month of the intervention, and they'd only been taking the ginger for four days, not the whole month, suggesting that it might work even better if women use ginger every period. What about the duration of pain? A quarter teaspoon of ground ginger three times a day not only dropped the severity of pain from about 7 down to 5, but decreased the duration from a total of 19 hours in pain down to about 15 hours, indicating that three quarters of a teaspoon of ginger powder a day for three days is a safe and effective way to produce pain relief in college students with painful menstrual cramps, compared to placebo, uh, capsules filled instead with powdered toast. Uh, but women don't take breadcrumbs for their cramps. How does ginger compare to ibuprofen? An eighth of a teaspoon four times a day of ginger for three days, or 400 milligrams of Motrin. And the ginger worked just as well as the drug of choice. If you do take the drug, though, a surprise to learn, it may be better to take drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen on an empty stomach, as this may speed up the pain relief and help keep people from taking higher doses. The Food and Drug Administration recently reopened comments about their policy of allowing some intestines, but not others, into the U.S. food supply. When the first few cases of mad cow disease started popping up, the FDA's gut reaction was to ban all guts from food and personal care products, but in 2005, USDA and FDA amended their draft rule to permit the use of the entire small intestine for human food if the last 80 uncoiled inches going to the colon was removed. Since then, those studies have shown that infectious mad cow prions can be found throughout all parts of the intestine from the stomach down to the cow's colon, raising the question of whether all entrails should again be removed. The North American Meat Association says no, wanting to keep all cattle insides inside the food supply, similar to what we heard from the CTFA, the Cosmetic Toiletry and Fragrance Association. They protested that by banning from cosmetics downer and dead cattle, as well as brain, skull, eyes, and spinal cord, as well as intestines and tonsils, our nation's supply of cosmetics could be put in jeopardy. Uh, there could be a tallow shortage for soap, for example. The FDA may not realize that cosmetics and personal care products are a quarter trillion dollar industry worldwide. In the end, the FDA tentatively concluded that intestines should continue to be allowed in the food and cosmetic supply because only trace amounts of infectivity have been found throughout the bowels of cattle, a conclusion they have to make since otherwise all meat would have to be banned 
as well, because new research shows that mad cow infectivity is in the muscles too. And not just the atypical cases of BSE, uh, like the last mad cow found in California, uh, but now we know the typical BSE as well, a bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease. Low levels of infectious prions are found in the ribs, shoulder, tenderloin, sirloin tips, and round cuts of meat. The latest estimates out of Britain suggest 15,000 people are currently incubating the human form of mad cow disease, contracted through the consumption of infected meat. Fewer than 200 Brits have died so far of variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but the incubation period for this invariably fatal neurodegenerative disease can be decades, uh, the time between eating the meat and one's brain filling up with holes. The fact that so many people are carrying it has important implications for the safety of blood transfusions. That's why many Americans who've lived in England are barred by the Red Cross from donating blood, as well as the safety of handling surgical instruments that may have cut into someone who's a carrier since it's so hard to sterilize anything once contaminated. Given these factors, it may be prudent to err on the side of caution when regulating which intestines are allowed on and in our mouths, but it's a balance. As one meat company points out, guts are not just used for lipstick. Intestine is human food, providing us with a precious source of protein, which is evidently essential for our human population. We've known for over 400 years that muscle weakness was a common presenting symptom of vitamin D deficiency. Uh, bones aren't the only organs that respond to vitamin D. Muscles do, too. But as we age, our muscles lose vitamin D receptors, uh, perhaps helping to explain the loss in muscle strength as we age. And indeed, vitamin D status does appear to predict the decline in physical performance as we age, with lower vitamin D levels linked to poorer performance. But maybe the vitamin D didn't lead to weakness. Maybe the weakness led to low vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin, and so if you're too weak to run around outside, that could explain the correlation with lower levels. To see if it's cause and effect, you have to put it to the test. There's been about a dozen randomized control trials, vitamin D supplements versus sugar pills, put all the studies together, and older men and women do get significant protection from falls with vitamin D, especially among those who start out with relatively low levels, leading the conservative USPSTF, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the official prevention guidelines setting body, and the American Geriatric Society, to recommend vitamin D supplementation for those at high risk for falls. We're not quite sure of the mechanism, though. Randomized controlled trials have found that vitamin D boosts global muscle strength, uh, particularly in the quads, which are important for fall prevention, though vitamin D supplements have also been shown to improve balance. Uh, so it may also be a neurological effect, or even a cognitive effect. Uh, we've known for about 20 years that older men and women who stop walking when a conversation starts are at particularly high risk of falling. Uh, over a six-month time frame, few of those who could walk and talk at the same time would go on to fall, but 80% of those who stopped when a conversation is initiated ended up falling. Other high-risk groups that should supplement include those who've already fallen once or are unsteady or on a variety of heart, brain, and blood pressure drugs that can increase fall risk. There's also a test called Get Up and Go, which anyone can do at home. You time how long it takes you to get up from an armchair, walk 10 feet, turn around, walk back, and sit down. If it takes you longer than 10 seconds, then you may be at high risk. So how much vitamin D should you take? It seems to take at least 700 to 1,000 units a day. 
The American Geriatric Society recommends a total of 4,000 a day, though, based on the rationale that this should get about 90% of people up to the target vitamin D blood level of 75 nanomoles per liter. 1,000 should do it for the majority of people, 51%, but they recommend 4,000 to capture 92% of the population. Then you don't have to routinely test levels, since you would get most people up there, and it's considerably below the proposed upper tolerable intake of 10,000 a day. They do not recommend periodic megadoses. Because it's hard to get patients to comply with pills, why not just give people one megadose, like 500,000 units once a year, uh, like when you come in for a flu shot or something? Uh, so every year you can at least guarantee everyone gets an annual spike in D levels that lasts a few months. It's unnatural, but certainly convenient, for the doctor at least. Uh, the problem is that it actually increases fall risk, a 30% increase in falls in those first three months of the spike. Similar results were found in other megadose trials. It may be a matter of too much of a good thing. Uh, see, vitamin D may improve physical performance, reduce chronic pain, and improve mood so much uh, that you start moving around more and thereby increase fall risk. You give people a whopping dose of D, and you get a burst in physical, mental, and social functioning, and it may take time for your motor control to catch up with your improved muscle function. It would be like giving someone a sports car all of a sudden when they've been used to driving some beater. You gotta take it slow. It's possible, though, that such unnaturally high doses may actually damage the muscles. The evidence they cite and support is a meat industry study showing you can improve the tenderness of steaks by feeding steers a few million units of vitamin D. So the concern is that such high doses may be over-tenderizing our own muscles as well. So yeah, higher D levels are associated with a progressive drop in fracture risk, but too much vitamin D may be harmful. The bottom line is that vitamin D supplementation appears to help but the strongest and most consistent evidence for prevention of serious falls is exercise. If you compare the two, yes, taking vitamin D may lower your fall risk compared to placebo, but strength and balance training with or without vitamin D may be even more powerful. The belief of green tea as a wonder weapon against diseases dates back thousands of years. I've talked about it in relation to chronic disease, but what about infectious disease? Interest in the antimicrobial activity of tea dates back to a military medical journal in 1906 suggesting that servicemen fill their canteens with tea to kill off the bugs that caused typhoid fever. However, this effect of tea was not studied further until the late 1980s, when tea compounds were pitted against viruses and bacteria in test tubes and petri dishes. But what we care about is, do they work in people? I had dismissed this entire field of inquiry as clinically irrelevant until genital warts. External genital warts caused by human wart viruses are one of the most common and fastest spreading venereal diseases worldwide. Patients with external genital warts present with one or several cauliflower-like growths on the genitals and or anal regions, considerably impairing people's emotional and sexual well-being. But rub some green tea ointment on, and you can achieve complete clearance of all warts in more than 50% of cases. Wow, if it works so well for wart viruses, what about flu viruses? Works great in a petri dish, but what about in people? Well, tea drinking school children do seem to be protected, but you don't know until it's put to the test. If you give healthcare workers green tea compounds, they come down with the flu about three times less often than those given placebo. 
In fact, just gargling with green tea may help. While a similar effect was not found in high school students, gargling with green tea may drop the risk of influenza infection seven or eightfold compared to gargling with water in elderly nursing home residents where flu can get really serious. Unlike antiviral drugs, green tea appears to help by boosting the immune system, enhancing the proliferation and activity of gamma-delta T cells, a type of immune cell that acts as a first-line defense against infection. Subjects who drank six cups of tea per day had up to a 15-fold increase in infection-fighting interferon production in as little as one week. But why? There's actually a molecular pattern shared by cancer cells and pathogens and with edible plant products such as tea, apples, mushrooms, and wine. So eating healthy foods may help maintain our immune cells on ready alert, effectively priming our gamma-delta T cells that can then uh, provide natural resistance to microbial infections and perhaps tumors. I guess I shouldn't have been so surprised. Tea, after all, is a vegetable infusion. You're basically drinking a hot water extraction of a dark green leafy vegetable. The U.S. public is not well protected by current dietary supplement recommendations. Sometimes there's too little of whatever's supposed to be in the bottle, and sometimes there's too much. Hundreds of people suffering from acute selenium toxicity thanks to an employee error at one of the suppliers. Months later, many continued to suffer. Had the company been following good manufacturing practices, such as testing their ingredients, this may not have happened. In 2007, the FDA urged companies to adhere to such guidelines, but seven years later, the majority of dietary supplement facilities remained non-compliant with current good manufacturing practices guidelines. What are the consequences of this ineffective regulation of dietary supplements? 50 thousand Americans harmed every year. Of course, prescription drugs don't just harm, but kill a hundred thousand Americans every year, and that's just in the hospital. Drugs prescribed by doctors outside of hospital settings may kill another 200,000 people every year. Uh, but this doesn't make it any less tragic for the thousands sickened by supplements. Sometimes the supplements may contain drugs. Not only does a substantial proportion of dietary supplements have quality problems, the FDA has identified hundreds of dietary supplements that have been adulterated with prescription medications, or even worse, designer drugs that haven't even been tested, like uh, tweaked Viagra compounds. About half of the most serious drug recalls in the U.S. aren't for drugs, but for supplements yet two-thirds were still found on store shelves six months later. Then there is inadvertent contamination with potentially hazardous contaminants, such as heavy metals and pesticides, and 90% of herbal supplements tested, and mycotoxins, potentially carcinogenic fungal toxins like aflatoxin, in 96% of herbal supplements. Milk thistle supplements were the worst, with most having more than a dozen different mycotoxins. This is thought to be because the plant is harvested specifically when it's wet, and so it can get moldy easily. And so you have these people taking milk thistle to support their livers, and end up getting exposed to immunotoxic, genotoxic, and hepatotoxic, meaning liver-toxic contaminants. How is this kind of thing even legal? It wasn't until 1994, with the passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Before that, supplements were regulated like food additives. You have to show that they were safe before being brought to the market. What a concept! But not anymore. Most people are unaware that supplements no longer have to be approved first, or, or that supplement ads don't have to be vetted first. This misunderstanding may provide some patients with a false sense of security regarding the safety and efficacy of these products. 
this deregulation led to an explosion in dietary supplements from around 4,000 when the law came into effect, to now more than 90,000 different supplements on the market, which are all now presumed innocent until proven guilty, uh, presumed safe until it hurts enough people. In other words, consumers must suffer harm before the FDA begins the slow process towards restricting the product from the market. Uh, take ephedra, for example. Hundreds of poison control center complaints starting back in 1999, increasing to thousands, including reports of strokes, seizures, and deaths. Yet it took seven years for the FDA to pull it off store shelves, thanks to millions from the industry spent on lobbying. What did the companies have to say for themselves? Metabolife swore that they had never received a single report of a single adverse effect from any customer. According to the company, Metabolife had a so-called claims-free history, whereas in fact they had gotten 14,000 complaints from customers, but covered them up. Basically, dietary supplement manufacturers have no realistic accountability for the safety of their products and the industry trade organizations have been accused of responding to legitimate concerns with bluster and denial. Yeah, but are these criticisms of dietary supplements just a big pharma conspiracy to maintain their monopoly? No. Big pharma loves dietary supplements because big pharma owns dietary supplement companies to dip into the tens of billions in annual sales. Virtually every day we are all confronted with the activity of our intestine, and it's no surprise that at least some of us have developed a fascination with our intestinal condition and its relation to health and disease. Over the last years, the intestinal microbiota, or gut flora, has been identified as like a fascinating new organ with all sorts of functions. Well, if the bacteria in our gut make up like a whole separate organ inside our body, what about doing an organ transplant? What would happen if you transferred intestinal bacteria from lean people into obese people? Researchers figured that rebalancing the obesity-causing bacteria with an infusion of gut bacteria from a lean person might help. Uh, now, they wanted this to be a placebo-controlled study, which for drugs is easy, give a sugar pill. But when you're sticking a tube down people's throats and transplanting feces, I'm thinking, what do you use as a poop placebo, a, a poopsebo, if you will? Both the donors and the subject brought in fresh stools, and the subjects are randomized to either get the donor stool or get transplanted with their own collected feces. That was the placebo. You get your own back. OK, so what happened? The insulin sensitivity of the skinny donors was up around 50. That's a good thing. High insulin sensitivity means low insulin resistance, the cause of both type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. The obese subjects started out around 20, and after infusion of their own feces, they stayed around 20. But the group of obese donors getting the skinny Similarly started out low, but shot up near to where the slim folks were. It's interesting, not all lean donor stools conveyed the same effect on insulin sensitivity, as some donors had very significant effects, the so-called super fecal donor, whereas others had little or no effect. Turns out this super donor effect is most probably conveyed by the amounts of short-chain fatty acid-producing intestinal bacteria in their feces, the food bacteria that thrive off of the fiber we eat. The short-chain fatty acids produced by fiber-eating bacteria may contribute to the release of gut hormones that may be the cause of this beneficial improved insulin sensitivity. The successful use of fecal transplantation has recently attracted considerable attention, not only because of its success, but its capacity to prove the cause and effect relationship that the bacteria we have in our gut can affect our metabolism. But within a few months, the bacterial composition returned back to baseline, so the effects on the obese subjects were temporary. 
We can get similar benefits, though, by just feeding what few good gut bacteria we may already have. Uh, say you have a shed full of bunny rabbits. Feed them pork rinds, and they all die. Yes, you can repopulate your shed by infusing new bunnies, but if you keep feeding them pork rinds, they'll eventually die off as well. Whereas, even if you start off with just a few bunnies, if you feed them what they're meant to eat, they'll grow and multiply, and soon you'll be full of fiber-eating bunnies. <laughs> Fecal transplants and probiotics are only temporary fixes if we keep putting the wrong fuel into our gut. But by feeding prebiotics, such as fiber, which means increasing whole plant food consumption, we may select for and foster the growth of our own good bacteria. However, such effects may abate once the high fiber intake ceases. Therefore, our dietary habits should include a continuous consumption of large quantities of high fiber foods to improve our health. And if we don't, we may be starving our microbial self. In Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 5, Ophelia notes that rosemary is for remembrance, an idea that goes back at least a few thousand years to the ancient Greeks who claimed that rosemary comforts the brain, sharpens understanding, restores lost memory, and awakens the mind. After all, plants can be considered little chemical factories that manufacture all sorts of compounds that could have neuroprotective benefits. So let's cut down on processed foods, eat lots of phytonutrient-rich whole plant foods, including perhaps a variety of herbs. Even the smell of certain herbs may affect how our brain works. Unfortunately, I've found much of the aromatherapy literature scientifically unsatisfying, like uh, there will be studies like this offering subjective impressions, and so fine, sure, sniffing an herbal sachet is indeed easy and expensive and safe, but is it effective? Uh, they didn't compare test scores or anything. Even when there is a control group where researchers had people do a battery of tests in a room that smelled like rosemary, lavender, or nothing, and even when they did compare test results, the lavender appeared to slow them down, impair their performance, whereas the rosemary group seemed to do better. But maybe that's just because of the mood effects. Maybe the rosemary group did better just because the aroma kind of pepped them up and not necessarily in a good way, maybe kind of overstimulating in some circumstances. Now, there have been studies that measured people's brain waves and were able to correlate the EEG findings with the changes in mood and performance, along with objective changes in stress hormone levels. But is this all just because pleasant smells improve people's moods? Uh, like if you created some synthetic rosemary fragrance with a bunch of chemicals that had nothing to do with the rosemary plant, would it still have the same effect? We didn't know until now. Aromatic herbs do have volatile compounds that theoretically could enter the bloodstream by way of the lining of the nose or lungs, and then potentially cross into the brain and have direct effects, but this was the first study to put it to the test. They had people do math in a cubicle infused with rosemary aroma, and so yes, they, they got that same boost in performance, but for the first time showed that how much better they did correlated with the amount of rosemary of a rosemary compound that made it into their bloodstream just from being in the room. And so not only did this show that it gets absorbed, but that such natural aromatic plant compounds may be playing a direct effect on changes in brain function. If that's just what smelling it can do, what about eating rosemary? We have the studies on alertness and cognition and reduced stress hormone levels inhaling rosemary. However, there were no clinical studies on cognitive performance following ingestion of rosemary until now. Older adults, average age 75, were given two cups of tomato juice with either nothing or a half teaspoon of powdered rosemary, which is what one might use in a typical recipe, 
or a full teaspoon, two teaspoons, or over a tablespoon of rosemary powder. And they even gave them some placebo pills to go with it to even further eliminate any placebo effects. Speed of memory is a potentially useful predictor of cognitive function during aging, and what they found is that the lowest dose had a beneficial effect, accelerating their processing speed, but the highest dose impaired their processing speed maybe because the half-teaspoon dose improved alertness, while the four-teaspoon dose decreased alertness. So rosemary powder at the dose nearest to normal culinary consumption demonstrated positive effects on speed of memory, the implicit take-home message being more isn't necessarily better. Don't take high-dose herbal supplements, extracts, tinctures. Just cooking with spices is sufficient a conclusion no doubt pleasing to the spice company that sponsored the study. No side effects were reported, but that doesn't mean you can eat the whole bush. This poor guy swallowed a rosemary twig, which punctured through the stomach into his liver, causing an abscess from which two cups of pus and a two-inch twig was removed. So, Explore herbs and spices in your cooking. Branch out. Just leave the branches out. In the 60s and 70s, a mystery was emerging. Why were childhood asthma rates in the developed world, between 2 and 5%, but in the developing world, as low as 0.007%? So instead of 1 in 20 kids affected, or 1 in 50 kids, it could be more like 1 in 10,000 kids, extremely rare. And when they moved from a low-risk area to a high-risk area, their risk went up, so it wasn't genetic. What was going on? Were they exposed to something new, or did they leave some protective factor behind? Well, way back in 1938, scientists showed they could stop asthma attacks by lowering children's sodium levels. Uh, but this was done with a diuretic drug. But subsequent dietary experiments showed that diets high in salt seemed to increase asthmatic symptoms, and lowering the salt seemed to decrease asthmatic symptoms. But this body of evidence was apparently forgotten until it was picked up again in the 1980s as a possible explanation for why Western countries had higher asthma rates. Maybe it was the salt. They graphed out childhood death from asthma versus family salt purchases, and it seemed more salt meant more death. But just because a family buys more salt doesn't necessarily mean the kids are eating more. The way you find out how much salt someone is actually eating is you collect their urine over a 24-hour period and measure the amount of sodium, uh, since how much salt we eat is pretty much how much salt we excrete. The way you test for asthma is called a bronchial challenge test, where you look for an exaggerated response to an inhaled chemical. And indeed, there was a strong correlation between how their lungs reacted and how much sodium they were taking in. But look, there's all sorts of food additives, like preservatives, that can trigger the so-called hypersensitivity reactions, and so maybe high sodium intake was just a marker for high processed food intake. Maybe it wasn't the salt at all. Or maybe it was other components of the diet. For example, the reason sodium may be a risk factor for another inflammatory disease, rheumatoid arthritis, may be that sodium intake is just a marker for increased meat and fish intake, or decreased fruit and vegetable intake. Uh, what we needed was a study where we take asthmatics, change the amount of salt in their diets, and see what happens. And so that's what came next take 10 asthmatics, double their salt intake, and in 9 out of 10 their lung sensitivity worsened. Uh, no control group, though. Maybe they would have all gotten worse anyway. 
Which brings us to the 90s, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Put everyone on a low-salt diet, but then give half of them these sustained-release sodium pills to bring their salt intake back up to a more normal intake. The other half gets placebo. Uh, you try that for five weeks, and then you switch them around for another five weeks. That's how you can randomize people to a true low-sodium diet without them even realizing it. Genius! So what happened? Asthmatics on the salt got worse. Their lung function got worse. Their asthma symptoms got worse, and they had to take more puffs on their inhalers. This is comparing asthmatics consuming about three teaspoons worth of salt a day to those consuming less than one, so they were effectively able to drop their sodium and take two teaspoons of salt worth. If you do a more pragmatic trial and only effectively reduce people's salt intake by a half teaspoon a day, it doesn't work. Even if you are able to cut your sodium down enough to get a therapeutic effect, though, it should be considered an adjunct treatment. Do not stop your asthma medications without your doctor's approval. Millions suffer from asthma attacks triggered by Exercise. Within five minutes of starting exercising, people can get short of breath, start coughing and wheezing, such that lung function significantly drops. But on a high-salt diet, the attack is even worse. Whereas on a low-salt diet, there's hardly a significant drop in function at all. To figure out why, researchers had them all cough up sputum from their lungs, and those on the high-salt diet ended up with triple the inflammatory cells, and up to double the concentration of inflammatory mediators. But why? What does salt intake have to do with inflammation? We didn't know until now. The Western diet, high in saturated fat and salt, has long been postulated as one potential cause for the increasing incidence of autoimmune diseases in developed countries. The rapidly increasing incidence of autoimmune diseases may be due to an overactivation of immune cells called T helper 17 cells. Uh, the development of multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, type 1 diabetes, Sjogren's, asthma, and rheumatoid arthritis at all, have all been shown to involve this T helper 17 driven inflammation. And one trigger for the activation of those Th17 cells may be elevated levels of salt in our bloodstream. The sodium content of processed foods and fast food can be more than 100 times higher in comparison to similar homemade meals. And sodium chloride, salt, appears to drive autoimmune disease by the induction of these disease-causing Th17 cells. Uh, turns out there's a salt-sensing enzyme responsible for triggering the formation of these Th17 cells. Organ damage caused by high-salt diets may also activate another type of inflammatory immune cell. A high-salt diet can overwork the kidneys, starving them of oxygen, triggering inflammation. The more salt they gave people, the more activation of inflammatory monocyte cells associated with high-salt intake-induced kidney oxygen deficiency. But this study only lasted two weeks. What about long term? One of the difficulties in doing sodium experiments is it's hard to get free living folks to maintain a specific salt intake. You can do what are called metabolic ward studies, where you essentially lock people in a hospital ward for a few days and control their food intake, but you can't do that long term unless you can lock people in a space capsule. Mars 520 was a 520-day space flight simulation to see how people might do on the way to Mars and back. What they found was that those on a high-salt diet displayed a markedly higher number of monocytes, uh, which are a type of immune cell you often see increased in settings of chronic inflammation and autoimmune disorders. This may reveal one of the consequences of excess salt consumption in our everyday lives, since that so-called high salt intake may actually just be the average salt intake. Furthermore, 
there was an increase in the levels of pro-inflammatory mediators and a decrease in the level of anti-inflammatory mediators, suggesting that a high-salt diet has the potential to bring about an excessive immune response, which may damage the immune balance and result in either difficulties in getting rid of inflammation or even an increased risk of autoimmune disease. What if you already have an autoimmune disease? Sodium intake is associated with increased disease activity in multiple sclerosis. If you follow MS patients for a few years, those eating more salt had three to four times the exacerbation rate, three times more likely to develop new MS lesions in their brains, and on average had eight more brain lesions, 14 in their brain compared to six in the low-salt group. So the next step is to try treating patients with salt reduction and see if they get better. But since reducing our salt intake is a healthy thing to do anyway, I don't see why anyone should have to wait. Sex is important to health. According to the Harvard Health Letter, frequent sexual intercourse is evidently associated with reduced heart attack risk. But this seems to me the perfect case for reverse causation. They're implying that more sex leads to healthier arteries, but isn't the opposite more likely, that healthier arteries lead to more sex? Blood flow in the penis is so reflective of blood flow elsewhere that penile Doppler ultrasound can predict cardiovascular disease. But low frequency of sexual activity may predict cardiovascular disease in men independently of erectile dysfunction, suggesting that sex may be more than just fun, but therapeutic. Or at least, so says an editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine, in discussing whether or not frequent sexual activity should be prescribed to improve general health. In men, they suggest, it's because more sex means more testosterone. When men make love, they get a big spike in testosterone levels in their blood, but interestingly, in contrast, they get no testosterone boost when they masturbate. This may be because testosterone increases with competitive success, like if you win at a game of sports. While sex is not usually regarded as a competitive event, one's mental state afterwards could nevertheless be something like that of a winner, as opposed to the mental state after masturbation. The spike in sex hormones in the blood is so great that men's beards actually grow faster on days they have sex. And since low testosterone levels are associated with increased risk of mortality, that could help explain the health benefits. So, do men who have more sex actually live longer? I did a PubMed search for sexual activity and longevity, and came up with sexual activity and longevity of the southern green stink bug. <laughs> Our taxpayer dollars hard at work. But I was less interested in whether or not screw worms live up to their namesake, and more interested in this, sex and death. A study whose objective was to examine the relation between frequency of orgasm and mortality. They found that men with high orgasmic frequency appeared to cut their risk of premature death in half, and apparently the more, the better. A 36% drop in mortality odds for every additional 100 orgasms a year. Conclusion? Sexual activity seems to have a protective effect on men's health, but not, it appears, if you cheat. Unfaithfulness in men seems to be associated with a higher risk of major cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes, Extramarital sex may be hazardous and stressful because the lover may be younger and more exuberant, and secret sexual encounters may be more stressful. In a large autopsy series, the majority of cases of sudden death during sex 
occurred in men having extramarital intercourse. The absolute risk is low. Only one out of 580 men might be expected to suffer such a death. But for those at high risk, sex in familiar surroundings, at a comfortable room temperature, and with one's usual partner may be safer. And speaking of safe sex, you thought drinking and driving was bad? While it's generally assumed that sexual behavior happens in parked cars, there's little discussion in the research literature of sexual activity in moving vehicles. About one in five college students report engaging in sex while driving, nearly half while going more than 60 miles an hour, including feats likely involving distraction. Researchers suggest maybe this is something that should be warned about in health class. When done right, though, love may protect your lover's life. Given the benefits of sexual activity, intervention programs could be considered perhaps based on the at least five-a-day campaign aimed at increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, although the numerical imperative may have to be adjusted. What are some pill-free ways to improve your sex life? Exercise, quit smoking, don't drink too much, don't weigh too much, and eat a healthy diet. Uh, but what does that mean? Heart-healthy lifestyle changes are sex-healthy lifestyle changes, as has been demonstrated in studies from around the world, including in women. Sexual function in women is also significantly affected by coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic narrowing of blood flow through our arteries, including the arteries that supply our pelvis. So high cholesterol may mean lower arousal, orgasm, lubrication, and satisfaction, and the same with high blood pressure. So putting women on a more plant-based diet may help with sexual functioning. Researchers found that improvements in female sexual function index scores were related to an increased intake of fruits, vegetables, nuts and beans, and a shift from animal to plant sources of fat. And the same with men, a significant improvement in International Index of Erectile Function scores. In fact, the largest study on diet and erectile dysfunction found that each additional daily serving of fruits or vegetables may reduce the risk by 10%. But why? It may be due to the anti-inflammatory effects. Two years on a healthier diet resulted in a significant reduction in systemic inflammation, as indicated by reduced levels of C-reactive protein. Fiber itself may play an anti-inflammatory role. Those who eat the most fiber tend to have significantly lower levels of inflammation in their bodies. The opposite was found for saturated fat, associated with an increased likelihood of elevated C-reactive protein levels. This is how we're used to seeing changes in inflammatory markers over weeks, months, or years. But people don't realize that the level of inflammation in our bodies can change after a single meal. For example, there's a pro-inflammatory signaling molecule in our bodies called interleukin-18, thought to play a role in destabilizing atherosclerotic plaques. As such, the level of interleukin-18 in the blood is a strong predictor of cardiovascular death. What would happen if you fed people one of three different types of meals? Sausage and egg butter oil sandwiches, or cheeseless pizza with a white flour crust, or the same cheeseless pizza but with a whole wheat crust. Within hours of eating the sausage sandwich, interleukin-18 levels shot up about 20%, an effect not seen eating the plant-based pizza and those eating the whole food plant-based pizza had about a 20% drop in IL-18 levels within hours. Reinforcing dietary recommendation to eat a diet high in fiber and starches and low in saturated fat to prevent 
chronic diseases. But the billions are in pills, not plants, which is why the pharmacology of the female orgasm is studied ever since 1972, when a researcher at Tulane University implanted tubes deep within the brain of a woman so he could inject drugs directly into her brain and was able to induce repetitive orgasms. A man who had electrodes placed into similar parts of his brain was given a device for a few hours that allowed him to press the button himself to stimulate the electrode. He pressed the button up to 1,500 times. We've been eating chia seeds for more than 5,000 years, historically one of the main crops grown in the Western Hemisphere. They're exceptionally high in fiber and omega-3 fatty acids, though like flax seeds it's better to grind them up. Even eating two tablespoons of whole chia seeds every day for 10 weeks led to no change in omega-3 levels, but the same amount of ground chia seeds did lead to a significant increase in blood levels of both short-chain and long-chain omega-3s. But there appeared to be no influence on inflammation or disease risk factors, no change in body fat, blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure, C-reactive protein, or any of the other markers of inflammation. An earlier study had purported to show a significant reduction in C-reactive protein levels, an indicator of systemic inflammation, compared to control. But if you look at the data, that's only because there was a significant worsening in the placebo group that was given a couple tablespoons of wheat bran a day instead. So it's not that the chia group got significantly better, the control group just got significantly worse. Uh, whenever researchers appear to be exaggerating their results, there's always a red flag to check their funding source. But they didn't disclose any conflicts of interest. Five years later, though, the truth came out. The study was indeed funded by a chia company, uh, furthermore, the lead investigator had filed a patent to use chia seeds to treat diseases. Why didn't they disclose this? Because the journal's conflict of interest policy evidently didn't specifically require the disclosure of such information. Anyways, the patent has since been abandoned, likely because subsequent studies found no significant benefits for weight loss, blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure, or inflammation after eating a quarter cup of chia seeds a day for three months. The original study did show a significant drop in blood pressure, which was replicated by other researchers, uh, though not as potent in effect as ground flaxseed. Uh, the primary reason I prefer flaxseeds over chia seeds, though, is their lignan content averaging about 15 times more than other seeds, including sesame and chia seeds, uh, thought to explain the anti-cancer effect of flax seeds for both prevention and survival. Chia seeds are certainly better than eggs and oil, though. By mixing one part chia seeds and nine parts water and letting it sit, you can create a chia gel that can be used as an egg or oil replacer in baked goods. Billions of pounds of seaweed are harvested each year, the consumption of which has been linked to a lower instance of chronic diseases, both physical and mental. Uh, for example, women who eat more seaweed during pregnancy appear to be less depressed, and have less seasonal allergy symptoms. But the problem with these cross-sectional correlational studies is that you can't prove cause and effect. Maybe seaweed consumption is just an indicator that they're following traditional Japanese dietary customs in general, which has lots of different aspects that can protect against disease. To know for sure if seaweed could modulate immune function, you have to put it to the test. So typically researchers start out like this in vitro, meaning like in a test tube, which makes for quicker, cheaper, easier experiments. Take eight different types of seaweed and basically make some seaweed tea you can drip on human immune system cells in a petri dish. It was studies like these 
that showed that the seaweed wakame, which is what you find in seaweed salad, can quadruple the replication potential of T cells, which are an important part of our immune defense against viruses like herpes simplex virus. Uh, yeah, but no one actually tried giving seaweed to people with herpes until this study. They gave people suffering from various herpes infections about 2 grams a day of pure powdered wakame, which is equivalent to about a quarter cup of seaweed salad. And all 15 patients with active herpetic viral infections experienced significant lessening or disappearance of symptoms. Uh, this included herpes virus 1, the cause of oral herpes, which causes cold sores, herpes virus 2, which causes genital herpes, herpes virus 4, also known as Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono, and herpes 3, which causes shingles and chickenpox. There was no control group, though, but with no downsides, why not give it a try? Anyway, if you're on a date and they ordered seaweed salad, you might want to ask them about their history. Researchers also found that wakame boosted antibody production, so might it be useful to boost the efficacy of vaccines? The elderly are particularly vulnerable to suffering and dying from influenza. Now the flu vaccine can help, but ironically the elderly are less likely to benefit because immune function tends to decline as we get older. So they took 70 volunteers over the age 60. This is the level of antibodies they had against the flu virus at baseline. And what you're looking for in a vaccination is to get a two-and-a-half-fold response. So we'd like to see this get up to at least 25 to consider it an effective response. But they only got up to here. Give them some wakame extract, though, every day for a month before the vaccination, and they jumped up to here. They used an extract rather than the real thing because they needed to put it in a pill so they could perform this randomized, placebo-controlled study. It's kind of hard to make a convincing placebo seaweed salad. It is hoped that the popular seaweeds eaten daily in Japan, though almost unknown everywhere else outside of Japanese restaurants, will start to be more widely consumed for possible immunopotentiation, boosting immunity, and for attenuating the burden of infectious diseases in the elderly. Recent human studies indicate that exposure to the plastics chemical BPA may be associated with infertility, miscarriage, premature delivery, reduced male sexual function, polycystic ovaries, altered thyroid and immune function, diabetes, heart disease, and on down the list. Yet as recently as March 2012, FDA stated that low levels of BPA in food are considered safe. But months later, to their credit, the agency banned the use of BPA plastics in baby bottles and sippy cups. Wow, regulators standing up to industry. Maybe I shouldn't be so cynical. Oh, wait, the ban was at the behest of the plastics industry. They had already stopped using BPA in baby bottles, so ban away. It was their idea. What they did is switch from BPA to similar compounds like BPF and BPS. And so now our diet contains everything from BPA to BPZ. So now the majority of us have these new chemicals in our bodies as well. Are they any safer? Well, based on the similarities of their chemical structures, they're all predicted to affect testosterone production and estrogen receptor activity, but only recently were they put to the test. We've known BPA significantly suppresses testosterone production, and now we know so does BPS and BPF, the first report describing adverse effects on a physiologic function in humans. Well, kinda. These were experiments performed on the testicles of aborted human fetuses.
But bottom line, BPS and BPF seem to have similar anti-androgenic, meaning anti-male hormone effects, to BPA. So when you're assured that don't worry your sales slip at the store was BPA-free, it may be just BPS instead. And BPS receipts may contain up to 40% more BPS than it would have had BPA, so BPA-free could be even worse. In fact, all BPA replacement products tested to date release chemicals having reliably detectable estrogenic activity. And this includes Triton, uh, which is specifically marketed as being estrogen activity free. But drip an extract on human breast cancer cells in a petri dish, and you can accelerate their growth, an effect that's abolished by an estrogen blocker, as you can see in the red lines. Now, this was after exposing them to simulated sunlight. Uh, only one out of three Triton products showed estrogen activity in an unstressed state, not exposed to microwaving heat or UV rays. Because there would be no value in trading one health hazard for another, we should urgently focus on the human health risk assessment of all these BPA substitutes. In the meanwhile, there are steps we can take to limit our exposure. We can reduce our use of polycarbonate plastics, which are usually labeled with recycle codes 3 or 7, and opt for fresh and frozen food over canned goods, especially tuna and condensed soups. Canned fruit consumption didn't seem to matter, but weekly canned vegetable consumption was associated with increased BPA exposure. If you do use plastics, don't microwave them. Don't put them in the dishwasher. Don't leave them in the sun or a hot car. And don't use once scratched. But using glass, ceramic, or stainless steel containers are probably best. It is clear that hardening of the arteries inside our brain and cognitive decline travel hand in hand, something I've addressed before. However, the independent association of Alzheimer's with multiple atherosclerotic vascular disease risk factors suggests that cholesterol is not the sole culprit in dementia. One of the most Consistent findings is elevated levels of blood pressure in midlife, meaning ages 40 through 60, is associated with elevated risk of cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's dementia later in life. In fact, even more so than having the so-called Alzheimer's gene. The normal arterial tree, all the blood vessels in the brain, is designed as both a conduit and cushion. But when the artery walls become stiffened, every time our heart pumps blood up into our brain, the pressure from the pulse can damage small vessels in our brains. This can cause what are called microbleeds in our brain, which are frequently found in people with high blood pressure, even if they were never diagnosed with a stroke. These microbleeds may be one of the important factors that cause cognitive impairments, Perhaps not surprisingly, because on autopsy, microbleeds may be associated with brain tissue necrosis, meaning brain tissue death. And speaking of tissue death, high blood pressure is also associated with so-called lacunar infarcts, from the Latin word lacuna, meaning hole. Holes in our brain that appear when little arteries get clogged in our brain and result in the death of a little round region of the brain. Up to a quarter of the elderly have these little mini-strokes, and most don't even know it, so-called silent infarcts. But no black holes in the brain are benign. This is what they look like. It's like your brain has been hole-punched. Although silent infarcts, by definition, lack overt stroke-like symptoms, they are associated with subtle deficits in physical and cognitive function that commonly go unnoticed, and they can double the risk of dementia. 
that's one of the ways high blood pressure is linked to dementia. So much damage that high blood pressure levels can lead to brain volume reduction, uh, literally a shrinkage of our brain, specifically in the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. This helps explain how high blood pressure can be involved in the development of Alzheimer's disease. One can actually visualize the little arteries in the back of our eyes using an ophthalmoscope, uh, providing a non-invasive window to study the health of one's intracranial arteries, the little vessels inside our head. The researchers found a significant association between arterial disease and brain shrinkage on MRI. But this was a cross-sectional study, just a snapshot in time, so you can't prove cause and effect. What you need is a prospective study following people over time, and so that's what they did. Over a 10-year period, those with signs of arterial disease were twice as likely to suffer a significant loss of brain tissue volume over time. The vast majority of breast cancers start out hormone-dependent, meaning the primary human estrogen, called estradiol, plays a crucial role in breast cancer development and progression. That's one of the reasons why soy food consumption appears so protective against breast cancer, because soy phytoestrogens, like genistein, act as estrogen blockers. They block the binding of estrogens, like estradiol, to breast cancer cells. But wait a second. The majority of breast cancers occur after menopause, when the ovaries have stopped producing estrogen. What's the point of eating estrogen blockers if there's no estrogen to block? It turns out the breast cancer tumors themselves produce their own estrogen from scratch to fuel their own growth. Estrogens may be formed in breast tumors by multiple pathways. The breast cancer takes cholesterol, and using the aromatase enzyme, or 2-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzymes, produces its own estrogen. So there's two ways to stop breast cancer. One is to use anti-estrogens, estrogen blockers, like the soy phytoestrogens or the anti-estrogen drug tamoxifen. However, another way to block estradiol is by using anti-enzymes to prevent the breast cancer from making all the estrogen in the first place. And indeed, there are a variety of anti-aromatase drugs in current use. In fact, inhibiting the estrogen production has been shown to be more effective than just trying to block the effects of the estrogen, suggesting that the inhibition of estrogen synthesis is clinically very important for the treatment of estrogen-dependent breast cancer. It turns out soy phytoestrogens can do both. Using ovary cells taken from women undergoing in vitro fertilization, soy phytoestrogens were found to reduce the expression of the aromatase enzyme. What about in breast cancer cells, though? Breast cancer cells, too. Not only suppressing aromatase activity, but the other estrogen-producing enzyme, too. But this is in a petri dish. Does soy suppress estrogen production in people, too? Well, circulating estrogen levels appear significantly lower in Japanese women than American white women, and Japan does have the highest per capita soy food consumption, but you don't know it's the soy until you put it to the test. Japanese women were randomized to add soy milk to their diet, or not, for a few months. Estrogen levels did seem to drop about a quarter in the soy milk supplemented group. Interestingly, when they tried the same experiment in men, they got similar results, a significant drop in female hormone levels with no change in testosterone levels. These results, though, are in Japanese men and women that were already consuming soy in their baseline diet. So it's really just looking at higher versus lower soy intake. What happens if you give soy milk to women in Texas? Circulating estrogen levels cut in half. Since increased estrogen levels are a marker for high risk for breast cancer, the effectiveness of soy to reduce estrogen levels may help explain why Chinese and Japanese women have such low rates of breast cancer. And what was truly remarkable is that estrogen levels stayed down 
a month or two even after they stop drinking it. Uh, this suggests you don't have to consume soy every day to have the cancer protective benefit. Standard American meals, rich in processed junk and meat and dairy, lead to exaggerated spikes in sugar and fat in the blood. This generates free radicals, and the oxidative stress triggers a biochemical cascade throughout our circulation, damaging proteins in our body, inducing inflammation, crippling our artery function, thickening our blood, and causing a fight-or-flight nerve response. Uh, this all happens within just one, two, three, four hours after eating a meal. Uh, worried about inflammation within your body? Well, one lousy breakfast could double your C-reactive protein levels before it's even lunchtime. Repeat that three times a day, and you could set yourself up for heart disease though you may not even be aware how bad off you are because your doctor is measuring your blood sugar and fat levels in a fasting state, typically drawing your blood before you've eaten. But what happens after a meal may be a stronger predictor of heart attacks and strokes, which makes sense since this is where most of us live our lives, in a fed state and not just in diabetics. If you follow non-diabetic women with heart disease, but normal fasting blood sugar, how high their blood sugar spikes after chugging some sugar water appears to determine how fast their arteries continue to clog up. Perhaps because the higher the blood sugar spike, the more free radicals are produced. So what are some dietary strategies to improve the situation? Thankfully, improvements in diet exert profound and immediate favorable changes. What kind of improvements? Specifically, a diet high in antioxidant, anti-inflammatory whole plant foods, uh, minimally processed, high-fiber, plant-based foods such as vegetables and fruits, whole grains, beans, and nuts will markedly blunt the after-meal increases in sugar, fat, and inflammation. What if you really want to eat some Wonder Bread, though? In less than an hour, you'd get a big spike in blood sugar, but if you smeared it with almond butter, what would happen? Adding about a third of a cup of almonds to the same amount of Wonder Bread significantly blunts the blood sugar spike. But wait, wouldn't any low-carb food help? I mean, why add almond butter when you can make a bologna sandwich? Well, first of all, plant-based foods have the antioxidants to wipe out any excess free radicals. So not only can nuts blunt blood sugar spikes, but oxidative damage as well, and blunt insulin spikes too. Adding nuts to a meal not only calms blood sugar levels, but also calms insulin levels. And now you're thinking, well, duh, less sugar means less insulin, but that's not what happens with low-carb animal foods. If you add some chicken to white rice, steamed skinless chicken breast, you get a greater insulin spike than just the white rice alone. So adding the low-carb plant food made things better, but adding the low-carb animal food made things worse. Same thing with adding chicken breast to mashed potatoes, a higher insulin spike with the added animal protein. Same thing with animal fat, add some butter to a meal, and get a dramatically higher insulin spike to some sugar. If you add butter and cheese to white bread, white potatoes, white spaghetti, or white rice, you can sometimes even double the insulin. Whereas if you add a half an avocado to a meal, instead of worsening, the insulin response improves, as it does with the main whole plant food source of fat, nuts. What if instead of nut butter on your Wonder Bread, you used an all-fruit strawberry jam? We saw how adding even steamed skinless chicken breasts can exacerbate the insulin spike from white rice, but fish may be worse. Here's the insulin score of a low-carb plant food like peanuts, compared to common low-carb animal foods, eggs, cheese, and beef. But fish was even worse. Uh, 
closer to donut territory. Here's the insulin spike if you feed people mashed white potatoes. Uh, then what would happen if you added some tuna fish? You get twice the insulin spike. Uh, same with white flour spaghetti and white flour spaghetti with meat. The addition of animal protein may make the pancreas work twice as hard. You can do it with straight sugar water. If you do like a glucose challenge test uh, to test for diabetes, where you drink a certain amount of sugar, this is the kind of spike in insulin you get. But if you take in the exact same amount of sugar, but with some meat added, you get this. And the more meat you add, the worse it gets. Just adding a little meat to carbs doesn't seem to do much, but once you get up to like a third of a chicken breast worth, you can elicit a significantly increased surge of insulin. So a chicken sandwich may aggravate the metabolic harm of the refined carb white bread it's on, but what about a PB&J? Well, we saw that adding nuts to Wonder Bread actually calms the insulin and blood sugar response. Uh, what if instead you smeared on an all-fruit strawberry jam? Uh, berries have even more antioxidants than nuts, and can indeed squelch the oxidation of cholesterol in response to a typical American breakfast, and even reduce the amount of fat in your blood after the meal. And with less oxidation, there is less inflammation when berries are added to a meal. So a whole plant food source of sugar can decrease inflammation in response to an inflammatory stressor meal. What about a whole plant food source of fat? If you eat a burger with a half an avocado on top, within hours the level of an inflammatory biomarker goes up in your blood but not as high as eating the burger without the avocado. This may be because all whole plant foods contain antioxidants, which decrease inflammation, as well as fiber, which is one of the reasons even high-fat whole plant foods like nuts can lower cholesterol. And the same could be said for avocados. Significant drop in cholesterol levels especially in those with high cholesterol, with even a drop in triglycerides. If eating berries with a meal decreases inflammation, what about drinking berries? Sipping wine with your white bread significantly blunts the blood sugar spike from the bread, but the alcohol increases the fat in the blood by about the same amount. If you eat some cheese and crackers, this is the triglycerides bump you get. If you sip some wine with the same snack, they shoot through the roof. Uh, now we know this it was the alcohol, because if you use de-alcoholized red wine, non-alcoholic red wine, the same wine but with the alcohol removed, you don't get the same reaction. This has been shown in about a half dozen other studies along with an increase in inflammatory markers, so it may help in some ways, but not others. A similar paradoxical effect was found with exercise. If you have people cycle at high intensity for about an hour, a half day before drinking a milkshake, the triglycerides response is less than without the prior exercise, yet the inflammatory response to the meal appeared worse. The bottom line is not to avoid exercise, but to avoid milkshakes. The healthiest approach is a whole food plant-based diet, but there are promising pharmacologic approaches to the normalization of high blood sugars and fat by taking medications. However, resorting to drug therapy for a, an epidemic caused by a maladaptive diet is less rational than simply realigning our eating habits with our physiological needs. Outdoor air pollution may be the ninth leading cause of death and disability in the world, responsible for millions of deaths from lung cancer, emphysema, heart disease, stroke, and respiratory infection. In the U.S., 
living in a polluted city was associated with a 16, 27, and 28 percent increase in total cardiovascular and lung cancer death compared to living in a city with cleaner air. Living in a city with polluted air may lead up to a 75 percent increase in the risk of a heart attack. No one wants to be living in a traffic jam, but it's better than dying in a traffic jam. In addition to causing deaths, air pollution is also the cause of a number of health problems. It may not only exacerbate asthma, but increase the risk of developing asthma in the first place. These pollutants may trigger liver disease, even increase the risk of diabetes. Even when atmospheric pollutants are within legally established limits, they can be harmful to health. So what can we do about it? Paper after paper describing all the terrible things air pollution can do to us, but most fail to mention public policy. We're making great strides in demonstrating the harmful effects, but public authorities are not using these data to reduce emissions as they might inconvenience the population and therefore might not be politically acceptable. To treat the cause, we need better vehicle inspections, efficient public transport, bus lanes, bicycle lanes, even urban tolls to help clean up the air. While we're waiting for all that, is there anything we can do to protect ourselves? Well, our body naturally has detoxifying enzymes not only in our liver, but lining our airways. Studies showing that people born with less effective detox enzymes have an exaggerated allergic response to diesel exhaust, uh, suggesting that these enzymes actively combat the inflammation caused by pollutants in the air. A significant part of the population has these substandard forms of the enzyme, but either way, what can we do to boost the activity of whichever detoxification enzymes we do have? Well, if you remember, broccoli can dramatically boost the activity of the detox enzymes in our liver. But what about our lungs? Researchers fed some smokers a large stock of broccoli every day for 10 days to see if it would affect the level of inflammation within their bodies. Why smokers? Because smoking is so inflammatory that you can end up with elevated C-reactive protein levels for up to 30 years after quitting. And that inflammation can start almost immediately after we start smoking, so it's critical to never start in the first place. But if you do, you can cut your level of that inflammation biomarker CRP nearly in half after just 10 days eating a lot of broccoli appears to cut inflammation in non-smokers as well, maybe explaining in part why eating more than two cups of broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, or other cruciferous veggies a day is associated with 20% reduced risk of dying compared to eating a third a cup a day or less. So what about air pollution? We know the cruciferous compound is the most potent known inducer of our detox enzymes, and so most of the research has been its ability to fight cancer. But here for the first time, they tried to see if it could combat the pro-inflammatory impact of pollutants such as diesel exhaust. They took some human lung lining cells in a petri dish, and this is how many detox enzymes are produced. Drip on some broccoli goodness, and you can get this many. Yeah, but we don't inhale broccoli, we don't snort it, we eat it. Can it still get into our lungs and help? Yes. Two days of broccoli sprout consumption, then you suck some cells out of their nose, and up to 100 times more detox enzyme expression compared to eating a non-cruciferous vegetable, alfalfa sprouts. Now, all we have to do is squirt some diesel exhaust up their nose, which is what some UCLA researchers did. An amount equal to uh, you know, daily rush hour exposure on the Los Angeles freeway. Within six hours, the number of inflammatory cells in their nose shot up and continued to rise. But in the group that had been getting a broccoli sprout extract, the inflammation went down and stayed down. Since the dose in these studies is equivalent to the consumption of one or two cups of broccoli, 
Their study demonstrates the potential preventative and therapeutic potential of broccoli. Uh, but if broccoli is so powerful at suppressing this inflammatory immune response, might it interfere with normal immune function? After all, the battle with viruses like influenza can happen in the nose. Let's drip some flu viruses into the nostrils of broccoli sprout eaters and find out. And what you get is the best of both worlds, less inflammation, yet an improved immune response. Eat alfalfa sprouts, and you can get this kind of viral spike in your nose, but after eating a package of broccoli sprouts every day, our body is able to keep the virus in check, potentially offering a safe, low-cost strategy for reducing influenza risk among high-risk populations. So better immune function, yet less inflammation, potentially reducing the impact of pollution on allergic disease and asthma, at least for an enthusiastic broccoli consumer. But what about cancer, uh, detoxifying air pollutants throughout the rest of our body? We didn't know until now. Off to China, where they have some of the worst air pollution in the world, and by day one, those getting the broccoli sprouts were able to get rid of 60% more benzene from their bodies, a rapid, highly durable elevation in the detoxification of a known human carcinogen. Uh, now, this was using broccoli sprouts, which are highly concentrated, equivalent to about five cups of broccoli a day, uh, so we don't know how well more modest doses would work, uh, but if they do, I mean, eating broccoli could provide a frugal means to attenuate the long-term health risks of air pollution. The World Health Organization has estimated that more than a million deaths worldwide are linked to low fruit and vegetable consumption. What can be done about it? There's always appealing to vanity. A daily smoothie can give you both a golden glow and a rosy glow, both of which have been shown to enhance one's healthy appearance in Caucasian, Asian, and African skin tones. But what about giving it away for free? A free school fruit scheme was introduced in Norway for grades 1 through 10. Fruit consumption is so powerfully beneficial that if kids just ended up eating 2.5 grams more fruit a day, the program would pay for itself in terms of saving the country money. Uh, that's the weight of half of a single grape. However, that's assuming that minuscule increased fruit consumption would be retained throughout life. It certainly seemed to work while the program was going on, with a large increase in pupils eating fruit. But what about a year after the free fruit ended? They were still eating more fruit. They were hooked. And then three years later, same thing. Eating about a third of a serving more three years later, considerably more, if sustained, than necessary for the free fruit program to pay for itself. And there were some happy side effects. There was a positive spillover effect, where not only were the kids eating more fruit, their parents started eating more too. And although the intention of these programs was not to reduce unhealthy snack intakes, that's exactly what appeared to happen. The fruit replaced some of the junk. Increasing healthy choices to crowd out the unhealthy ones may be more effective than just telling kids not to eat junk which could actually backfire. When you tell kids not to eat something, they may start to want it even more. Which do you think worked better, telling families to increase plants or decrease junk? Families were randomly assigned to one of two groups. Encouragement to get at least two servings of fruits and veggies a day, with no mention of decreasing junk, and the other group were encouraged to bring their junk food intake to less than 10 servings a week, but with no mention of fruits and veggies. What do you think happened? The increased fruit and vegetable intervention just naturally reduced their high fat and sugar intake, whereas those told to just decrease fat and sugar cut back on junk, but didn't magically start eating more fruits and vegetables. 
This crowding out effect may not work on adults, though. In a cross-section of more than 1,000 adults in L.A. and Louisiana, those that ate five or more servings of fruits and veggies a day did not consume significantly less alcohol, soda, candy, cookies, and chips. This finding suggests that unless the excessive consumption of junk is curtailed, other interventions may have a limited impact. It may be politically more expedient to promote an increase in consumption of healthy items rather than a decrease in consumption of unhealthy items, but it may be far less effective. In most public health campaigns, the message is direct and explicit. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't take drugs. In contrast, food campaigns have focused on eat healthy foods, then cut out the crap. Explicit messages against junk are rare. In the U.S., if just half of the population were to increase fruit and vegetable consumption by one serving each per day, an estimated 20,000 cancer cases might be avoided each year. 20,000 people who would not have gotten cancer had they eaten their fruits and veggies. The USDA recommends half our plate be filled with colorful fruits and vegetables, but less than 10% of Americans hit the recommended daily target. Given the sorry state of affairs, should we even bother telling people to strive for five a day? Or might just saying, get one more serving than you usually do, end up working better? The researchers thought that the more realistic just one more goal would be more effective than the very ambitious five a day goal, but they were wrong. Those told to eat one more for a week ate about one more, and those that were told to eat five ate five. But here's the critical piece. A week later, a week after the experiment was over, the group that was told to eat five a day was still eating about a serving more, whereas the eat one more group went back to their miserable baseline. So more ambitious eating goals may be more motivating. Perhaps this is why in the U.S. five a day was replaced with a recommended daily consumption of 7 to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables. But if the recommendation is too challenging, people may just give up. So instead of just sticking with the science, policymakers need to ask themselves questions like, how many servings are regarded as threatening? Researchers who accept grants from the Coca-Cola Company uh, may call physical inactivity the greatest public health problem of the 21st century, but actually physical inactivity ranks down at number five in terms of risk factors for death in the United States, and number six in terms of risk factors for disability. And inactivity barely makes the top ten globally. As we've learned, diet is by far our greatest killer, followed by smoking. Of course, that doesn't mean you can just sit on the couch all day. Exercise can help with mental health, cognitive health, sleep quality, cancer prevention, immune function, high blood pressure, and lifespan extension. If the U.S. population collectively exercised enough to shave just 1% off the National Body Mass Index, 2 million cases of diabetes, 1.5 million cases of heart disease and stroke, and 100,000 cases of cancer might be prevented. Ideally, how much should we exercise? The latest official physical activity guidelines recommend adults get at least 150 minutes a week of moderate aerobic exercise, which comes out to be a little more than 20 minutes a day. Uh, that's actually down from previous recommendations from the Surgeon General and the CDC and American College of Sports Medicine, which recommended at least 30 minutes each day. The exercise authorities seem to have fallen into the same trap as the nutrition authorities recommending what they think may be achievable, rather than simply informing us what the science says and letting us make up our own mind. They already emphasize that any physical activity is better than none, so why not stop patronizing the public and just tell everyone the truth? It is true that walking 150 minutes a week is better than walking 60 minutes a week, 
following the current recommendations for 150 minutes appears to reduce your overall mortality rate by 7% compared to being sedentary. Walking for only 60 minutes a week only drops your mortality rate about 3%. But walking 300 minutes a week drops overall mortality by 14%. Uh, so walking twice as long, 40 minutes a day, compared to the recommended 20, yields twice the benefit. And an hour-long walk each day may reduce mortality by 24%. I use walking as an example because it's an exercise nearly everyone can do, but the same goes for other moderate-intensity activities such as gardening or cycling. This meta-analysis of physical activity dose and longevity found that the equivalent of about an hour a day of brisk 4 miles per hour walking was good, but 90 minutes was even better. What about more than 90 minutes? Unfortunately, so few people exercise that much every day that there weren't enough studies to compile a higher category. OK, but if we know 90 minutes of exercise a day is better than 60 minutes, is better than 30 minutes, why is the recommendation only 20 minutes? I understand that only about half of Americans even make the recommended 20 minutes a day, so the authorities are just hoping to you know, nudge people in the right direction. It's like the dietary guidelines advising us to eat less candy, if only they just give it to us straight. That's what I try to do here at nutritionfacts.org. A famous case report called The Mortician's Mystery in the New England Journal of Medicine back in the 80s described a man whose testicles started shrinking and breasts started growing. It turns out he failed to wear gloves as he massaged embalming cream onto his corpse. Uh, they conclude there must have been some estrogenic compound in the cream that got absorbed through his skin into his body, one of the first such cases described. This case was cited as inspiration by a group of researchers that came up with a new theory to explain a breast cancer mystery. Why do most breast cancers occur in the upper outer corner of the breast? Uh, the standard explanation was simply because that's where most of the breast tissue is located, as the so-called tail of the breast extends up into the armpit. Uh, but that doesn't explain this. It didn't always used to be that way. There's been a shift towards that upper corner. And it doesn't explain this. Greater genomic instability, chromosome abnormalities that may signal precancerous changes. There definitely seems to be something happening to that side of the breast, and something relatively new just in the last 50 years or so. Is it possible that the increasing use of underarm antiperspirant, which parallels increasing breast cancer incidence, could be an explanation for the greater number of tumors and the disproportionate incidence of breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant of the breast near where the stick spray or roll-on is applied. There's a free flow of lymph fluid back and forth between the breast and the armpit, and if you measure aluminum levels in breasts removed after mastectomies, the aluminum content of breast tissue in the outer regions near the armpits was significantly higher presumably due to closer proximity to the underarm region. This is a concern because in a petri dish, at least, it has been demonstrated that aluminum is a so-called metalloestrogen, having proestrogenic effects on breast cancer cells. Long-term exposure of normal breast tissue cells in a test tube to aluminum concentrations in the range of those found in the breast results in precancerous type changes. And then once the cells have turned, those same concentrations can increase the migratory and invasive activity of human breast cancer cells in a petri dish. This is important because women don't die from the tumor in the breast itself, but from the ability of the cancer cells to spread and grow at distant sites like the bones, lungs, liver, or brain. But we don't care about petri dishes. We care about people. In 2002, a paper was published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in which the underarm antiperspirant habits of 800 breast cancer survivors was compared to women who never got breast cancer. 
the first study of its kind, and they found no indication of a link between the two. Based on this study, Harvard Women's Health Watch assured women that antiperspirants do not cause breast cancer. Women who are worried that antiperspirants might cause breast cancer can finally rest easy. But two months later, this study. Frequency and early onset of antiperspirant deodorant usage with underarm shaving was associated with an earlier age of breast cancer diagnosis as much as 20 years earlier. In women using antiperspirant and shaving their armpits more than three times a week, and the earlier they started before versus after their sweet 16 appeared to move up their breast cancer 10 or 20 years, they conclude that underarm shaving with antiperspirant use may play a role in breast cancer after all. But what does shaving have to do with it? Shaving removes more than just armpit hair. It removes armpit skin. You end up shaving off the top skin layer. And while there's very little aluminum absorption through intact skin, when you strip off that outer layer with a razor and then rub on some antiperspirant, you get a six-fold increase in aluminum absorption through the skin. So good news for women who don't shave, but on the other hand, the high through the skin aluminum uptake on shaved skin should compel antiperspirant manufacturers to proceed with the utmost caution. European safety authorities and the FDA specifically advise against using aluminum antiperspirants on damaged or broken skin, yet shaving before antiperspirant application can create abrasions in the skin. I'm sure everyone knows about the FDA warning, having read Title 21, Part 350, Subpart C50-5C1 of the Code of Federal Regulations. But we get so much aluminum in our diet from processed foods, anti-caking agents and like pancake mix, melting agents in American cheese, meat binders, gravy thickeners, baking powder, candy, that the contribution from underarm antiperspirants would presumably be minimal in comparison. But everything was turned topsy-turvy in 2004, when a case was reported of a woman with bone pain and fatigue suffering from aluminum toxicity. But within months of stopping the antiperspirant, which she was applying daily to her regularly shaved pits, her aluminum levels came down and her symptoms resolved. Although not everyone sucks up that much aluminum, the case suggests that caution should be exercised when using aluminum-containing antiperspirants frequently. Recently, it was shown that women with breast cancer have twice the level of aluminum in their breasts compared to women without breast cancer, though this doesn't prove cause and effect. Maybe the aluminum contributed to the cancer, or maybe the cancer contributed to the aluminum. Maybe tumors just suck up more aluminum? Subsequent research suggests this alternative explanation is unlikely. So where do we stand now? The latest review on the subject concluded that as a consequence of the new data, given that aluminum can be toxic and we have no need for the stuff, reducing the concentration of this metal in antiperspirants is a matter of urgency. Or at the very least, it should say on the label, do not use after shaving. Or we could cease usage of aluminum-containing antiperspirants altogether, uh, but then won't we stink? Ironically, antiperspirants can make us stink worse. They increase the types of bacteria that cause body odor. It's like the story with antidepressant drugs, how they can actually make you more depressed in the long run. The more we use antiperspirants, the more we may need them. Awfully convenient for a billion-dollar industry. A study published in 1999 raised the exciting possibility that cheap, simple, innocuous, and ubiquitous vitamin C supplements could prevent a condition known as preeclampsia. But a decade of research later, we realized that was merely a false hope, and that vitamin C supplements appear to play little role in women's health. 
but they're talking about oral vitamin C, not vaginal vitamin C, which has been found to be an effective treatment for bacterial vaginosis, an all-too-common gynecological disorder characterized by a fishy-smelling, watery gray discharge. Bacterial vaginosis can best be described as an ecological disaster of the vaginal microflora. The normal lactobacillus-type good bacteria get displaced by an army of bad bacteria. Uh, probiotics may help repopulating with good bacteria, but the reason the bad bacteria took over in the first place was that the pH was off. I've talked about the role diet may play in the development of this condition. For example, saturated fat intake may increase vaginal pH, allowing for the growth of undesirables. So why not try to reacidify the vagina with ascorbic acid, otherwise known as vitamin C. Now, this isn't just plain vitamin C tablets, but specially formulated silicone-coated supplements that release vitamin C slowly so as not to be irritating. How well do they work? A hundred women suffering from the condition split into two groups, and the vaginal vitamin C beat out placebo. But how does vitamin C compare to the conventional therapy in antibiotic gel? This is an important question. Although perceived as a mild medical problem, bacterial vaginosis may increase the risk of several gynecological complications, including problems during pregnancy where you want to avoid taking drugs whenever possible. The vitamin C appeared to work as effectively as the antibiotic, and so especially like in the first trimester when you really don't want to be putting drugs up there, vitamin C can really help. And for women with recurrent episodes, using the vitamin C for six days after each cycle appears to cut the risk of recurrence in half. More than a thousand years ago, an ancient Persian medical text advised for the treatment of hypertension lifestyle interventions such as avoiding meat and pastries, and recommended eating spinach. A thousand years later, researchers discovered that a single meal containing spinach could indeed reduce blood pressure thanks to its nitrate content. All green leafy vegetables are packed with this stuff, which our body can use to create nitric oxide that improves the flexibility and function of our arteries, which may be why eating our greens may be one of the most powerful things we can do to reduce our chronic disease risk. Just switching from low nitrate vegetables to high nitrate vegetables for a week can lower blood pressures by about four points. And the higher the blood pressure they started out with, the greater benefit they got. Four points might not sound like a lot, but even a two-point drop in blood pressure could prevent more than 10,000 fatal strokes every year here in the U.S. Potassium-rich foods may also act via a similar mechanism. If we just got the minimum recommended daily intake of potassium, we might prevent 150,000 strokes every year, because potassium appears to increase the release of nitric oxide. One week of eating two bananas and a large baked potato every day significantly improved arterial function. Even a single high-potassium meal uh, containing the equivalent of uh, two to three bananas worth of potassium can improve the function of our arteries. Whereas a high-sodium meal, which is to say a meal with the regular amount of salt most people eat, can impair arterial function within 30 minutes. Whereas potassium increases nitric oxide release, sodium reduces nitric oxide release. So the health of our arteries may be determined by our sodium to potassium ratio. Uh, two slices of bacon worth of sodium in our arteries take a significant hit within 30 minutes. But add three bananas worth of potassium, and you can counteract the effects of the sodium. 
when we evolved, we were eating 10 times more potassium than sodium. Now the ratio is reversed, more sodium than potassium. These kinds of studies provide additional evidence that increases in dietary potassium should be encouraged. What does that mean? More beans, sweet potatoes, and leafy greens, which are like a super good double whammy, high in potassium and nitrates. This recommendation to eat spinach from the 900s is pretty impressive, though they also recommended bloodletting and abstaining from sex. So we should probably take ancient wisdom with a grain of salt, but our meals should be added salt-free. We are walking communities comprised not only of a Homo sapiens host, but also of trillions of symbiotic commensal microorganisms within the gut and on every other surface of our bodies. There are more bacterial cells in our gut than there are human cells in our entire body. In fact, only about 10% of the DNA in our body is human. The rest is in our microbiome, the microbes that we share this walking community we call our body. What do they do? Our gut microbiota, our gut bacteria microbiome, serve as a filter for our largest environmental exposure, what we eat. Technically speaking, food is a foreign object that we take into our bodies by the pound every day, and the microbial community within each of us significantly influences how we experience those meals. Hence, our metabolism and absorption of food occurs through this filter of bacteria. But if we eat a lot of meat, poultry, fish, milk, cheese, eggs, we can foster the growth of bacteria that convert the choline and carnitine in these foods into TMA, trimethylamine, which can be oxidized into TMAO and wreak havoc on our arteries, increasing our risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. We've known about this troublesome transformation from choline into trimethylamine for over 40 years, uh, but that was way before we learned about the heart disease connection. Why were they concerned back then? Because these methylamines might form nitrosamines, which have marked carcinogenic activity, cancer-causing activity. So where is choline found in our diet? Uh, mostly from meat, eggs, dairy, and refined grains. The link between meat and cancer probably wouldn't surprise anyone. In fact, just due to the industrial pollutants alone, like PCBs, children probably shouldn't eat more than like five servings a month of uh, meats like uh, beef, pork, or chicken combined. Uh, but what about cancer and eggs? Studies going back to the 70s hinted at a correlation between eggs and colon cancer, but that was just based on so-called ecological data, showing that countries that ate more eggs tended to have higher cancer rates, but that could be due to a million things. Right? It needed to be put to the test. This started in the 80s, and by the 1990s, 15 studies had been published, 10 suggesting a direct association between egg consumption and colorectal cancer, and 5 showing no association. By 2014, there were dozens more studies published confirming that eggs may indeed be playing a role in the development of colon cancer though no relationship was discovered between egg consumption and the development of precancerous polyps, which suggests that eggs might be involved more in the promotional stage of cancer growth, accelerating cancer growth, rather than initiating the cancer in the first place. Which brings us to 2015. Maybe it's the TMAO made from the choline in meat and eggs that's promoting cancer growth. And indeed, in the Women's Health Initiative study, women with the highest TMAO levels in their blood had approximately three times greater risk of rectal cancer, uh, suggesting TMAO levels may serve as a potential predictor of increased colorectal cancer risk. 
though there may be more evidence for elevated breast cancer risk with egg consumption than prostate cancer risk, the only other study to date on TMAO and cancer looked at prostate cancer and did indeed find a higher risk. Diet has long been considered a primary factor in health. However, with the microbiome revolution of the past decade, we've begun to understand how diet can affect the back and forth between us and the rest of us inside. And the whole TMAO story is like a smoking gun in gut bacteria disease interactions. Since choline and carnitine are the primary sources of TMAO production, the logical intervention strategy might be to reduce meat, dairy, and egg consumption. And if we eat plant-based for long enough, we can actually change our gut microbial communities such that they may not be able to produce TMAO even if we try. The theory of you are what you eat is finally supported by scientific evidence. Uh, we may not have to eat healthy for long, though. Soon we may yet be able to drug the microbiome as a way of promoting cardiovascular health.